Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you may or may not be familiar with our opening and closing hymn. It is a, an old Advent hymn. Uh, for my history class at the seminary, we had to memorize this hymn, and we sang it at the beginning of every class to help us memorize it. Because our, our, on our final test, one of the things was basically to sit down and write the whole hymn out. Um, that might seem burdensome, but if you turn to page 332 in your hymnal and look at the bottom and see that the man who wrote it was Ambrose, and he wrote it in the 300s AD, you see why we were connected to history. What a blessing it is that in this season of Advent, we have such things that are, have been around for centuries, almost over millennia, for us to sing these truths that, that the church has been singing for a long time. And especially this time of year, a phrase which is common uh, these days, you've maybe heard it before, wait for it. A guy that my generation knew as Doogie Hauser, uh, yeah. the younger generation knows as some guy in a program I've never watched called How I Met Your Mother. But this phrase is one of his favorites, and it's one of those phrases that have become part of how our society kind of gets ready for things. Wait for it. Common phrase. A verbal pregnant pause, if you will. If you will. Wait for it then the punchline comes. Wait for it, then comes some amazing information. Wait for it, then comes a profound revelation. Wait for it, then comes the grand finale. Wait for it, we live in such a distracted state. It has become necessary for us to have a mechanism in our method of communicating to get people's attention before these big points come up. We need a line to get people to pay attention for the grand, grand finale or some important piece of information. The Advent season is all about waiting for it. And today's text from Hebrews is addressing that grand finale that the Hebrews have been waiting for since God's promise to Moses some 1,400 years earlier since God's promise to Abraham some 2,000 years earlier, from God's promise to Noah some 2,350 years earlier, from God all the way back to God's promise to Eve some 4,000 years earlier. It's a long time to wait for a promise to be fulfilled. God's people had been waiting for a long time, so long that they got bored, they misbehaved. They, quit, they quite often would go through the motions of being God's people, but their hearts were not really in it. That is what led to God telling his people through David in the 40th Psalm, which is what our text is quoting from, that he did not want to have anything to do with their worthless sacrifices. They were hollow, they were empty. Consequently, now I, I kind of had I picked apart our text for this evening and took all the things that we're talking about, they're hollow, and the things that talk about what Christ came to do, and I separated them. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth in the text this evening. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings I have not desired. You have not desired. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. He didn't want anything to do with them because they were doing them so hollowly. Just as we get impatient, waiting a few weeks for the Christmas time to come during Advent, waiting for a few hours of worship, waiting for a few minutes of a sermon, waiting for too many stanzas of a hymn. But God's people 
had a pretty good reason to get impatient. Waiting for millennia, waiting for generations, one's whole lifetime could be a part of a waiting line, and you don't even know where it's going to come in. This would and can, does lead in simple people to impatience. However, how we deal with this impatience is what gets us in trouble. If we press on, living out our vocation, going to God's house to receive his gifts for us, loving God and our neighbor as he would have us to do it, it doesn't matter then where we fit on the timeline. As long as we are faithful. But we live in a very apathetic age. Wait for it. An impatient, apathetic age. People going through motions and hating every minute of it. Like a child who does what they're told, but makes sure through their actions that everyone knows that they don't like what they're doing. Sadly, time and again, God's people got very impatient, hollow, empty, going through the motions about their sacrifices and their worship. I try to think of some modern examples of how this might look to us. Maybe something along the lines of digging deep into my pocket and hoping to pull up a bunch of small coins so it looks like I'm putting something big in there. Or maybe it might look something like this. This is a pew. <laughs> we don't have any sleepers here, by the way. Um, luckily. Uh, anyway, there's also, uh, you can see when the elders and the acolytes and when I'm up here, we don't just go be bopping around in this area, the chancellery. We show solemnity. We show, because this is the place where the Lord comes to us on a regular basis. You don't see, like I was talking about the kid, if you saw something like this, You need to show the solemnity that goes with the place that you're in for it to make sense. And I wanted to give you these crazy examples because this is the reason that God is telling his people in the Psalms that's being quoted in Hebrews that he does, they're just worthless to him because he sees how empty and hollow their actions are. Quoted here in Hebrews, but in response to all of these Old Testament failures, Jesus doesn't tell them in this text or anywhere else in the scriptures to try harder. He never says, just try harder to be better. If you find that in the Bible, let me know because I haven't found it yet. Three times in this text, he points out that he's come to do it on our behalf. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do the will of God, your will, O God. As it is written of me, in the scroll of the book, the whole Old Testament points to the fact that he has come to do this. But a body have you prepared for me. This is, Advent's a good time for this text because this is speaking of his incarnation. This is the fact that God prepared for him, God the Father prepared for God the Son by begetting him a body to come into the flesh, to come and do it for us. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He's not telling you to do God's will, love God and your neighbor in order to get to paradise because you can't do it. He's telling you that he's come to do it for you. All of the Old Testament sacrifices had a purpose. Even if they were doing them improperly or trying to, they pointed out, they taught and retaught, innocent blood must be shed for payment, for atonement, for redemption, for reconciliation. Not to abolish, but to fulfill the law. 
And I tell you all that to tell you this. Wait for it. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In Jesus' name, amen.